are a guest, let us know that you're here. You can also fill out the uh, QR code on the back of the bulletin. And then also do not forget to grab a gift bag on your way out the door today. Uh, there is a new series happening in the Truth Seekers classroom uh, called Let God Teach You. Uh, that is in room 11 if you are interested in that. Head on down to room 11 at 10 o'clock today. Also, Women on Mission, do not forget that you're meeting today at 2 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. And then also, like I said last week, uh, Easter is early this year, and so practice for the cantata has already, or is getting ready to start on the 16th. So if you are interested in uh, joining the, the choir for the cantata, uh, let Jan know, and we will see you at 7 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, there is a Women Helping Women event uh, at New Hope Baptist Church on this coming Saturday from 11.30 to 2 with Lynn Cooper and, uh, Sor so let's say, Sarana Barker. Is that right? My eyes don't work. Uh, if you want to go to that, ladies, uh, please uh, let Nancy Mooney know. The information and the email is also in your bulletin, so you can check that out uh, if you want to reserve your spot for that event. Uh, if you're interested in joining our handbell choir, uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center. Sign-ups, uh, I think it will just kind of be an ongoing thing. Like, if you can just join in and handbell whenever you want. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, or if you want more information, uh, ask Jan, and she'll let you know a little bit more about that. But if you're interested, make sure you sign up for that. Uh, there is a Walk to Emmaus, or two, I guess, Walk to Emmaus events coming this coming May. Uh, and to kind of tell you a little bit more about that, Carl Bagley has a few words, and I'll also mention that uh, if there's anything else you want to go at home and think about, you can look at your bulletin where there's a lot more information as well. Uh, but we're going to let Carl, who uh, has been to this event a few times, come up and tell you a little bit about that. I told Jean, I said, this won't take long. And she says, Carl, you're as bad as me. You can't do anything quickly or say anything quickly. Walk to Emmaus. I want to encourage you, encourage you. Think about it, pray about it, and then act upon it. I put off going to the walk. I had six invitations. So it figures the guy who's standing here can tell you what it's like not to act on it. My sixth invitation came, and it came from Jean Holmes, a lady I've known for well over, I think, 20 or 30 years. Jean called me, and when she called, she didn't get the words out of her mouth, and I said, yes, I want to go. The walk to Emmaus is your opportunity to give God three days of your life without your phone, without your computer, and without the everyday hassles of life, and to turn yourself over to the Holy Spirit. And y'all, I'm gonna tell you something. And I told Jean this, she went to the walk before me. Keith and Lynn had been, and let me see, Denny and Kathy went on walk 10 and 11. I was 81, and Curtis, I don't remember what walk he was, Keith, what walk was number was? 115. 115. Curtis went last fall and his wife's going on the next women's walk. Will your life change? Yes. Do you want a deeper, more meaningful, more dedicated and committed disciple of Jesus Christ? If that's what you want to become and you want to mature in your faith, give God three days. Your life will change. Keith and Lynn can tell you, Jean can tell you, Denny and Kathy can tell you, and Curtis can tell you. Oftentimes, we spend all of our time and effort devoting ourselves to going to business-related functions where we grow and we learn and we become more effective. And of course, we make more money. Oftentimes in life, I can speak well of this, we ignore our spiritual life. And y'all, I'm telling you, it's time to bring new life, as Pastor said, in 2024. That's why it's in your bulletin. 
presented as a new ministry, when in fact it has been around for many, many years. I have watched men. There's a men's walk and a women's walk. I have seen men go from being some of the biggest, meanest, toughest things you've ever seen when the walk started to being broken down, made anew by the time we had got to Sunday night. I'll close with this. I consider the walk to Emmaus one of the key spiritual events of my life. And when you look back over your life, you've got some key spiritual events. And if you don't, then I'd suggest you might want to get busy and have some. That Sunday night, I couldn't even talk. I couldn't even talk on the way from Blackstone then back home. I couldn't even talk. And we'll all tell you the same thing about Monday morning. When Monday morning comes and we have to go back into the real world, we don't want to go. And re-entry is tough. So all of us on the committee want to encourage you. And we're hoping that we can send two men, two women, to two walks a year. A total of eight people. And maybe even more. Thank you. Psalm 29 describes the voice of the Lord. Have you ever heard the voice of the Lord? Maybe you have. I have not audibly heard God speak to me. I have certainly heard God speak. And part of this psalm reminds us that God does not only speak audibly, as he has to some as we read the Bible, but he speaks in other ways, and especially in nature. And that is what this psalm is about, how God's voice is seen and what is around us. But also a call for us to give God the glory that is due his name. And he certainly is a worthy God. So Psalm 29 this morning as our scriptural call to worship. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is above the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord above the vast water. The voice of the Lord in power. The voice of the Lord in splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. 
The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the woodlands bare. In his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We're thankful for the reminder that your glory, your voice is seen and heard throughout creation. And that in the earthly temple, in the heavenly temple, in here, this, your house this morning, we with creation and the angels cry to you, glory, glory. For Lord, you are worthy of all honor and praise and glory and worship. We are thankful that you are king over the universe and that you are king of our lives and that you give us strength and peace. We are thankful for that strength and the peace you have given us in this past week. And we gathered this morning, Lord, to be strengthened again and to receive your peace, your mercy, your glory, uh, and your love and your grace. And Lord, I pray that this would would be our special time with you this morning and with each other. May you be pleased and may you be glorified. And I pray, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Stand with me, please, and we'll continue to worship the Lord in song this morning.
Good morning, Olive Branch. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father God, you are the rock that never wavers. We lean into you when all things fail and when the enemy appears on our path. Thank you for your continuous protection. We ask that you may restore the faith of those who come today broken. Strengthen those who may feel weak. For those who are anxious, we pray for peace. And for those who are lost, we pray for salvation. We ask your blessings, Father, over our service today. May your will be done in our church, heart, and lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Wright is going to give us an update on Mecklenburg impact. And so, Lori, would you come please and tell us what's happening? We're about halfway through the year from last year and the next one coming up. I cannot believe we are 
uh, super close to our first impact of 2024. There's some differences this year and I wanna give y'all some updates. Um, the committee is super passionate about Impact Mecklenburg and we have decided to offer two weeks of Impact this year. And our first week is gonna be an alternative spring break opportunity for high school kids. It'll be the first week of April. Um, the, we're limiting the groups to 40 total participants. They'll come in on a Monday, April 1st, and work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and go home on Friday. So a shortened week, we'll do two to three projects. Um, they will be housed at Sanford Memorial, so not very far. In the coming weeks, we'll be letting you know about some volunteer opportunities for that. And then we're also going to do regular summer work camp, which is going to be a week earlier than it has been the past two summers. It'll be June 16th through Saturday, June 16th, or yeah, Sunday, June 16th through Saturday, June 22nd. And a change from previous years, we're going to be hosted at First Baptist Church South Hill. Um, the rumor has it that um, we're going to see a significant increase in campers this summer because we are, there's th um, fewer camps this summer and we're the first week of the summer which traditionally has a higher participation rate across all camps across Virginia. So I'm really excited for that. Again, we will keep you all informed about volunteer opportunities for that. An opportunity to get trained to volunteer is also gonna be happening, I understand, on March 9th. Olive Branch is going to be hosting a disaster response general training opportunity. The disaster response food kitchen is going to be set up different. It's actually going to be a food truck, which only needs like three to five volunteers, unlike those of you that have done disaster response food prep for impact, where we need like 10 to 15 volunteers. So it's a much smaller, more efficient way of serving up to 150 dinners per um, meal time. And so that's what our impact camps are gonna be utilizing. And if you're interested in learning how to do that, that's a great day, Saturday, March 9th, to be able to do that. I am The committee, in addition to me, are really grateful for Olive Branch's significant ongoing support. Y'all provided fabulous committee members an amazing array of volunteers, lunches at all the camps, um, disaster response volunteers, as well as generous financial um, contributions. I want y'all to remember that so far we have helped 16 homeowners uh, improve the safety and warmth and accessibility of their homes across Mecklenburg County. We've also served 150 uh, youth volunteers, um, enabling them to have access to a worship experience over the course of, of impact. So y'all's volunteer and financial contributions are making a difference in people's lives across the community. And I wanted to remind you and, and let y'all know that for me, why do I do Impact Mecklenburg? Why is it so important to me? And um, one of the reasons is because my community is really important to me and my church family is really important to me. But ultimately, it's about my faith in Jesus and my relationship with him. And there's just a few Bible verses I wanted to share with you that really highlight what impact is for me and maybe encourage you all to get involved as well. Um, the first one is what loving your neighbor looks like. And that verse is from Luke 10, verses 27 and 28. And it says, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. To which Jesus responded, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. The next verse is uh, about serving your neighbor, and it's found in Galatians 5.13. And it says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And the last verse is about giving and living generously. And it's found in Acts 20, starting in verse 35, where Paul says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So I just want to say thank you for all your continued support of Impact. If you have any questions, by all means, ask me, ask Vance, ask Steve Carroll, 
and anybody else that has participated in these camps. Um, we're really excited about 2024. And uh, um, again, I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Lord Jesus, as we come to your word now, I pray that you would help us to see. I pray, Lord, you would also help us to understand. And more than that, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move us to be obedient this morning. I pray your blessing upon the time in your word. And Lord, as we spoke of your voice at the beginning of our service, now, Lord, we want to hear your voice. As we've seen it in nature on our way here, we want to hear you speak in our heart and our soul right now. And we ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen. <clears throat> think about your spiritual walk with God. We often think of it as a walk, as a journey. And I often, for some reason, think of it as a walk through the woods. I don't know why in particular. You can walk in all kinds of ways. You can walk down a city street. and You can walk on a track. And you can walk up a mountain. But I often think of it as a walk through uh, the forest or the woods. That's how I think about our walk with God. Maybe that's because as you walk, you don't necessarily know what is coming up. There aren't a lot of signs to tell you uh, what's coming up a, a few hundred feet away. And so there's some unknown to it. Uh, also, it can be beautiful as you walk through the forest. There's also a lot of unknown, lots of critters in the forest <laughs> that can uh, pop up on the trail. Uh, there's lots of ways to get distracted and go off the trail. And at times, the trail can look very uh, foreboding and scary as you walk through dark, dense forests. And so, again, for me, as I think about my walk with God, I think about it as a journey. And as in any journey, there's twists and turns, there's ups and downs, there's sunny days and rainy days. There are distractions and there are victories and there are failures where we stumble and fall. And as we think about that journey, I want it us today to talk about how we can finish that journey well, because not everyone does so. Tragically, many people begin a walk with God, but by the end of their life, they are far from God, and some have even rejected God. And I don't want that for myself or for you, and that's why I want to share today from the life of King Asa how his life did not end well, but ours can. Uh, as I said, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Robert Clinton, a professor emeritus at Fuller Seminary, said that 70% of leaders do not finish well. When I read that, I, I hope he's not talking about moral failure for all 70% of pastors and Christian leaders. I think he has that in mind, but also something more as though we finish uh, with laziness, or we finish far from God. We finish with uh, an apathy to our spiritual life. Once where there was vigor and life and a desire to seek God, we finish a leadership walk with God far from Him. And from our Christian culture, there are many examples. Here I've listed three, and I don't want to focus on them to call them out or to... Uh, make a, an embarrassment statement about them, but just to tell you and to show you that just because someone is front and center of our American Christian culture doesn't mean that they finish well either. Michael English was a very successful singer in the 90s and also sang with the uh, Gaither vocal band, uh, later an affair and later walking from the faith and denouncing Christianity altogether. Josh Harris was a popular author his book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, was a bestseller where he encouraged young people not to date in the traditional sense we do in America, but to do courtship and to think more about their faith in their dating. Well, in 2019, he disavowed the book altogether and said he was no longer a Christian. And Jennifer Knapp, also a Christian singer, who said that she was gay and that she was no longer a Christian. And these are just a few examples of many that could go on and on this morning. I don't want that for me or for you. 
And so let us learn from this king of Judah. In the next few weeks, we're going to look at the kings that the Bible said were good kings in the line of Judah. And we're going to talk today about Asa, who was the great-grandson of King Solomon and the great-great-grandson of King David. And let's learn about him so that we can finish well in our journey with God. It says in 2 Chronicles 14, Asa did what was good and right in the sight of the Lord his God. Wouldn't you love to hear God say that about you? And you put your name in there. Wayne did what was good and right in the sight of the Lord his God. I would hope that God would be able to say that about me and about you. So the chronicle here tells us that Asa was a good king because he did what was right. So let's look at his life, what he did right, and also a tale for us of how to avoid the end of his life. So in the first years of his reign, there was peace. There was no war. And because of that, he spent time with religious reform. So he had idols that were torn down. Uh, the people of Judah in this day had a hard time with their idol worship. They would worship the gods of the Canaanites. You are very familiar with these names if you've read any of the Old Testament. Uh, Baal was the primary god that was worshipped. And his consort was Asherah. And so there were Asherah poles that were built to worship her. And so constantly throughout the history of Israel and Judah, when they were not worshipping God, they would worship Baal and Asherah. And so it was not only Asa, but many other kings had to come in and say, Stop! Why are you worshiping these Canaanite gods? Worship the Lord our God. And so that's what Asa did, telling them to tear down these idols and cut down these poles. He told the people to seek God and to obey God. Wow, wouldn't you love to hear leaders telling us that today? You know, we have uh, an election year. Wouldn't it be awesome to hear the politicians, instead of arguing, say, people, this is the answer. Seek God and obey him. Now, wouldn't that be awesome to hear? And that's what this king did. He said, this is how we are to live, people. Seek God and obey him. Because there was peace and he didn't have to spend his money on battles, he started building cities and fortifying those cities so that others could not attack them. So a very successful beginning to his reign. A time of peace, building, seeking God, and obeying him. And so my question is, has your, has your spiritual journey even begun? I believe there's always a spiritual journey in the sense that God is always calling. So even those before we become a Christian, before we are saved, God is calling us. And God is bringing things into our lives to bring us to repentance. And he is calling us to believe. And so maybe you're in that part of the journey where God is calling to you. Or... You can remember the day where you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you were saved. And in a sense, that's a new beginning to our walk. Because before God was calling us and now we walk with him. And do you remember? It's not, the, the, we don't need to go back to that moment or to that day or to that era in our Christian life and try to relive it or try to uh, have the same emotions. That's not what I'm saying to do, but I, I do think this is often the case of new believers. New believers are often excited to learn more about God. They're often excited about serving God. Uh, they're often excited about their new faith and they're telling other people about it. But as we are Christians longer and longer and longer, that doesn't become the case anymore. And that's what's so sad. That's what I'm asking you to think about and to look back to. Was there that time where you just couldn't wait to read Scripture and you couldn't wait to tell someone what had happened to you and you couldn't wait to be in church and couldn't wait to have another group of believers together and couldn't wait to go do something for God? Many Christians would say, yes, that's what it was like. Well, it doesn't have to stop being that way. It can continue to be so. Asa was tested because there was the Libyans and the Cushites who came to attack. 
And we're told in the scripture that Asa had actually hundreds of thousands of soldiers, but the Cushites had twice as many. And the Cushites also had chariots, which, as you read the Old Testament, is a constant problem with the Israelites. Uh, their military equipment was some par and inferior to the nations that were around them. So they're fighting with arrows and with swords, and their enemies are coming with iron chariots. What was a king to do? Well, he was a righteous king, a good king, and like a king that told the people to seek God and to obey him, he called out to God. He cried to the Lord, Lord, there is no one besides you to help the mighty and those without strength. Help us, Lord our God, for we depend on you. And in your name we have come against this large army, Lord. You are our God. Do not let a mere mortal hinder you. What a beautiful prayer. He is being attacked and he goes right to God and says, God, help us. Win the battle for us. Much like David had done when he fought Goliath. David didn't focus on Goliath at all. He focused on God. He focused on how God would give him the victory. And throughout the scripture, again, as you read the Old Testament, many kings did put their faith and trust in God. And God always brought deliverance. And that's what Asa did. You see, God... We're outnumbered two to one. Our, our military is inferior. We will lose unless you help us. And God did that. God gave them a victory, a resounding victory. And they slaughtered the army of the Cushites and the Libyans and even went farther into their territory and went to the cities and, and looted from them and brought back to Judah. A victory because God said yes to Asa's prayer. And then a prophet came. The Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Odid. So he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin, hear me. The Lord is with you when you are with him. Listen to this. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. For many years, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest and without instruction. But when they turned to the Lord God of Israel in their distress and sought him, he was found by them. In those times, there was no peace for those who went out their daily activities because the residents of the lands had many conflicts. Nation was crushed by nation and city by city for God troubled them with every possible distress. But as for you, be strong. Don't give up, for your work has a reward. And so the prophet Azariah says to Asa, be strong. Don't give up. Your work has a reward. God blessed Asa and the nation because they had called out to him. So not only did they receive a victory, God was with them and continued to bless them. And I want you to remember this. In the Old Testament, God had made a covenant with his people. And it was very simple. He said, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will bring disease and war and famine. I will, in a sense, curse you. It was a very simple covenant. It's not the same covenant God has made with us. I always have to say that because uh, sometimes we hear uh, you know, someone say, well, if you follow God, then you will be blessed. And if things are bad in your life, it's because you're not following God and you have a lack of faith. That's not necessarily true. Because we are under a new covenant, and that simple promise has not been made to us. Although the general principle is true, because those who do follow God do receive many blessings, and those who abandon God and follow their own ways do come to many problems. But it's not a simple equation as that simple covenant was with the people. But the middle years of Asa's reign was even better than the first. He removed more idols. He restored the altar that was at the temple. 
He even removed his grandmother from the court. Okay? His grandmother had herself an Asherah pole. So right there in the midst of his royal family was an idol worshiper, and it was his grandmother. Notice how he put God over family and kicked his grandmother out of the royal palace. That showed the courage that he had. He encouraged the people to gather in Jerusalem and they made a promise to God that they would seek God with all of their heart and soul. And he even had silver and gold and he consecrated them to God and he brought them into the temple. Do you see how his faith has been encouraged and it's been strengthened and how he's gone even farther in his walk with God and even closer to God and even more bold in his faith to even kick his grandmother out because he is seeking God and obeying God. I want you to think about your spiritual life because it doesn't have to be bad for it to get better. You know, the nation was in a good place. Idol worship had been eliminated. And they were seeking God and they were obeying God. And Asa called out to God when there was a test. So they were doing well. But with an encouraging word from the prophet Azariah, they did even better. And so maybe you are in a place in your spiritual walk where you are doing well. Well, think about how you could do even better. How you could be closer, how you could be more obedient. Because in reality, and we'll share it in a moment, our walk with God is a daily commitment. It's not a one time commitment that's made when we come to Christ in faith, it's not a one time commitment that's made every time there's a revival, it's not a weekly commitment that we make every Sunday when we come to church, it's a daily commitment commitment. And even though yesterday you may have been close to God and obedient and following Him with all your heart and soul, that doesn't necessarily mean you will today. And so today there needs to be a commitment to Him. Well, there was a second test, and this is where Asa did not finish well. And this is what is so sad about his life. The king of Israel, Basha, Remember, the kingdom had been divided after Solomon, and so there were Israelites in the north and Israelites in the south. And remember, the northern Israelites, their kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. So again, remember, Asa is the king of Judah. To the north is his brethren, so to speak, and Basha is the king of Israel. Well, Basha comes and he builds a city six miles from Judah. and So he's provoking War, and he wants to start a war with Asa. And this time, Asa takes all of that gold and silver that he had consecrated and he had put into the temple. He takes it, he goes to the king of Aram, and he says to the king of Aram, I want you to attack Basha. Now, the king of Aram had made a, a treaty with Basha not to do that. So not only is he taking gold from the temple and hiring a mercenary to go and attack his enemy, he's telling his uh, king of Aram, he's saying, break your treaty, break your promise, go and attack King Bassa, and then I won't have this problem anymore. So a man who had trusted God before now wants to trust in another king. And militarily, it worked. The king of Aram went and attacked the king of Israel. The king of Israel backed away. And then Asa went to that city where King Basa had built. And he goes there and he takes all the timber and the stones and he goes and builds more cities with that. And so everybody's happy. This was a great treaty. This was a great strategy. Look at what you did, Asa. Here was another threat, and with your intelligence, you have put an end to it. But God was not pleased. And before, there was Azariah who came and brought a message of encouragement and hope. The next prophet who came 
Hananiah came with a word of destruction. At that time, the seer Hananiah came to King Asa of Judah and said to him, Because you depended on the king of Aram and have not depended on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped you. Were not the Cushites and Libyans a vast army with many chariots and horsemen? When you depended on the Lord, he handed them over to you. For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. Hear that verse again. The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. And Asa was not wholeheartedly devoted. And because of this rebuke, you would think Asa, if he was a godly man, would repent. But he didn't. He was stubborn in his disobedience and he was stubborn in his rebellion And the words of Hananiah did not move him whatsoever. And, in fact, he takes Hananiah and he throws him into prison. So the message comes from God and he imprisons the messenger. And then it says he was so angry he started persecuting other people in his kingdom. I guess for no other reason that he's angry. And then God sent to him a physical disease... We're not told specifically it had something to do with his feet. And instead of repenting then, Asa refuses to pray to God. And what he does instead is he goes to the doctors. The doctors can't help him, but he will not go to God. We don't know what happened in his life to go from someone who was so committed to God to someone who refused to even acknowledge God when he was physically ill. And who rebelled against God and would not trust in him but trust in other kings. We don't know what happened but we do know the sad end of his life. The last six years of his rule were spent in rebellion, anger, hatred. And he dies in sickness because he would not repent. He would not follow God as he had In previous years. So it's a warning. For 35 years of his rule, he was a king who was committed to God and obeyed him. For the last six, he was far, far from God. So, brothers and sisters, maybe you have walked with God for 35 years or for 50 years or more, and you think, well, this is easy. I've got it. I'm gonna just skate on in and sail in. And my warning to you is do not do that, not have that attitude, but realize it's a daily commitment to follow God. And even though maybe you have followed God faithfully for decades, if we do not continue to seek God, when we do not repent, when we are rebuked by God, we may end our life in rebellion and hatred and anger rather than in peace rather than in love, rather than in fellowship with God. And our time is over, and so I'm going to just read this verse and show you quickly four things I want you to think about so that you do not end up like Asa. Paul finished his fight. Paul's life was the opposite. He was a persecutor of Christians until God saved him, and then he faithfully walked with God till the end. He told his fellow (coughs) laborer, Timothy. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. And so, to prevent ending miserably, as Asa did, daily spend time focused in communion with God in prayer and Bible study. Daily appropriate the gospel. In other words, don't think about the gospel, the good news of Jesus, as something that was once when you heard it and now you're done with it. But the gospel talks about how we are sinners and it talks about how God died to save us and it talks about God's grace and about how he enables us through the Holy Spirit to live for him. That's a message we need to hear every day. 
and not just one time. We are called to be a living sacrifice. Do that daily and firmly believe in the sovereignty and the love of God. You can make a different list. You can make a longer list. But the important thing is, here's four ways. You can think of others maybe. But the important thing is to daily seek God and obey Him so that we finish well. And what is there that you need to do today to make sure that you will finish well? Lord, I'm thankful for Ace's example because it's a warning. No matter how well we think we are doing, Lord, we know a test, we know a temptation, we know an idleness or a laziness or a step away from you could be the first step to a life that's far from you and in rebellion and misery. And Lord, I pray that would not happen to me. I pray it would not happen to my brothers and sisters. And I pray that we would not take lightly the fact that this may happen. For there are many that we know publicly. There are many that we know in our personal lives who have walked with you so well, but have not ended their journey with you well. So Lord, may we examine ourselves now in this time of response. And Lord, may we right now make a commitment to seek you. For we know your eyes are roaming this earth to find those who will seek and follow you. And I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we close our service in response to what God has spoken to your hearts. And if you want to pray with me, I will be with up here to pray with you. Let's pray, and then you'll be dismissed for Sunday school. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we uh, do look at our own lives, that we are mindful of the fact that we are called to endure, and that we're called to endure to the end. And I pray that as we look uh, through the lives of these kings, that we do see uh, moments where they do run the race well. And I also pray that we are mindful of the moments where they have fallen short. And uh, may we be mindful of the fact that we too have fallen short, and that we do Uh, constantly have moments where we're not uh, living as we should in in the honor of of your son's name. So I pray that as we leave here today, we are uh, committed to running a race to the finish. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.